second day, everybody. Welcome to Rocky Mountain Readings, where last week we broke into the wonderful book, uh, Words That Hurt, Words That Heal, How the Words You Choose Shape Your Destiny. And uh, I am so enjoying this. It's something I definitely can integrate more of into my life for sure. Um, and we finished off on Thursday with part four, which was um, a lot of review of the earlier uh, uh, work. And today... Um, we're on chapter 14, uh, which is titled, Where Heaven and Earth Touch, a National Speak No Evil Day. And I guess this is uh, one of the most flattering things that can ever happen for an author is that uh, uh, all the energy and effort you put into writing uh, it gets accepted in, in, in a great degree. And uh, uh, people that take the time to write wonderful works uh, always... Uh, hope that they uh, uh, reach the target for sure. So, yeah, let's break into uh, uh, Chapter 14. Shalom, Sheila. Always glad to have you with us, Mom. Okay, so where heaven and earth touch, a national speak no evil day. What if we could share our consciousness of the power of words with many others, even the whole nation? Tens of millions of Americans annually observe the great American smokeout and Earth Day one concerned with eliminating pollution of our bodies, the other, the pollution of our planet. A national Speak No Evil Day could work to eliminate the pollution of our emotional atmosphere, the realm in which we interact with others. I envision Speak No Evil Day as being observed on May 14th, starting in 1996. Indeed, Senators Connie Mack of Florida and Joseph Liberman of Connecticut have introduced a resolution in the U.S. Senate to establish such a day, Speak No Evil Day would have both short and long-term goals to eliminate all vicious and unfair talk for 24 hours and thus plant the seed of a more permanent shift in our consciousness. On this day, people will attempt to refrain from saying a single nasty comment about others. Just imagine, even if true, only in the very rare instances when it's absolutely necessary to transmit negative information will they do so. Otherwise, like those who engage in periodic cleansing fasts to purify their bodies, people will go for an entire day without uttering unfair or hurtful talk. On this day, people will also monitor and regulate how they speak to others. Everyone will strive to keep his or her anger under control. But just imagine, if a person does express anger, he will do so fairly and limit his comments to the incident that provoked his ire. People likewise will argue fairly and not allow their disputes to generate in, to degenerate into name-calling or other forms of verbal abuse. No one, not even a person offering deserved criticism, will humiliate another. In short, on Speak No Evil Day, people will strive to fulfill the golden rule and will speak about others with the same kindness and fairness that they wish others to exercise when speaking about them. I hope that journalists and other media professionals will be touched by the spirit of the day, while retaining the right to report relevant negative items about public figures, they will omit innuendos, sarcastic asides, rumors, and the publicizing of private scandals. On Speak No Evil Day, all of us will refrain from disseminating rumors, particularly negative ones. On this day, too, people will strive to avoid hurting and defaming groups as well as individuals by avoiding bigoted, sweeping comments even for one day, we may finally come to view others as individuals and realize that negative stereotypes of large ethnic, religious, racial, and gender groups are unfair and untrue. A rabbi once told me that his grandmother used to say, it is not within everyone's power to be beautiful, but all of us can make sure that the words that come out of our mouths are. That's a nice statement for sure. Speak No Evil Day will be a 24-hour period of verbal beauty. It will be a day when a young child frequently teased by his classmates can, and called by an ugly nickname can go to school confident. No one will say a cruel, wor cruel word to him. It will be a day on which an employee with a sharp tongue boss can go to work without fearing that he or she will be verbally abused. It will be a day on which that sharp tongue boss, the type who says, I don't get ulcers, I give them, might come to understand how vicious such a statement is. Shalom, Ashley G. Glad to have you with us. 
and will say nothing uh, that will cause pain. It will be a day when a fat adolescent will not have to fear uh, a biting comment about his weight from parents or peers. It will be a day when a man who once served a prison sentence but who was released, who has led an exemplary life since being released, will not have to fear that a journalist will publicize his earlier behavior. It will be a day when a controversial candidate who suffered a nervous breakdown will not have to worry that his opponent will use this painful episode to publicly humiliate him. It will be a day when an African-American or Hispanic-American can be among other Americans without fearing that she will hear prejudicial comments or ugly words about herself for her racial group or her racial group. It will be a day when a husband who usually only tells his wife uh, complaints will tell her instead that he loves her and why. It will be a day when people will use the words that heal others' emotional wounds, not those that inflict them. In short, Speak No Evil Day will be a day when, through humankind's collective efforts, we will experience a taste of heaven on earth. A Jewish proverb teaches, If you will it, it is no fantasy. If we only want it enough, Speak No Evil Day is possible. Let us try. Oh, and that's the end of the book already. Oh, there's the appendix on the, the, the resolution Speak No Evil Day that was put forward by Connie Mack and Joseph Lieberman. Um, and then it's all notes. Yeah, so, gee, I almost should have finished it on Thursday, but I'm going based on the numbers of the pages marked down below here, which show there's still uh, another 30 to go, or on the... Um, Kindle edition is still showing uh, another almost nine over 900 more. I thought there would be more to the book in that regard, but uh, I must admit this has been a wonderful, wonderful book. So uh, rather than just call it short in 10 minutes, I'm going to go through my notes with you. These three questions always ask yourself when you're going to speak. Is it true? Is it necessary? And is it fair? As a rule, the rationale for wrong, for wrongful acts is self-interest. Uh, embezzlers wish to make quick money. Guilty defendants manufacture alibis to avoid being punished. And thieves break into a house because they desire another's possessions. Yeah, understand the way the wicked mind thinks. Okay, there's a tremendous psychological gratification in seeing someone else's social status decline. And that is a sign of, um, Shalom Zakia, that is a sign of uh, psychotic uh, behavior for sure. So I'm just doing a review. Uh, when you've got an Ill, Ill mentality, you, you also derive great enjoyment from seeing a come down for those who summon us to a morally upright life. And this is one thing to consider, especially as B'nai Noach, if you're out there trying to hold a higher moral standard in society and you feel that the world is always against you, it is true because of this. People love to see somebody who talks such a high moral game, you know, held to an even higher standard. If they think that you're always holding them to a standard. Um, yeah. Another way people seek to elevate themselves is by uh, retailing inside information about others so that we'll be perceived as being in the know. Ooh, the pride of man is terrible, eh? And this point I thought was interesting, dealing with teenagers, uh, especially girls versus uh, uh, teenage males. Among girls, status is linked to being more connected to the in crowd. Girls get Status by being friends with high status girls, the cheerleaders, the pretty ones, the ones who are popular with boys. If being friends with those of high status is a way to get status for yourself, how are you to prove to others that a popular girl is your friend? One way is to show that you know her secrets because it is in the context of friendship that secrets are revealed. So 
So yeah, when people ha- uh, 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 are are in the quest to be perceived as people who had the inside scoop. Yet a third reason we speak ill of others is to exact revenge against people who have wronged us, but whom we are too timid to confront. Yeah, so these are behaviors you could drop for sure. Uh, Certain types of gossip that uh, you want others to share your anger. We often fail to describe very precisely the offense committed against us. Most of us are masters at attributing horrendous motives to people who have hurt us. Our exaggerations, of which we ourselves might not be fully aware, are aimed at provoking others to validate and share our rage. Ugh, I've known people that function that way. Terrible. Talking about where uh, certain things, disputes, initiate whole cycles of injury. And don't ever be afraid to say to somebody else, I think it was unfair of you too. Uh, We mentioned about self-righteous pleasure of our rage, you know, how people don't realize rage is personal uh, idolatry. But most of the time, however, gossiping merely intensifies the dispute and lessens the chances of reconciliation. So you need to cut it off. Develop a way of talking about others that is as kindly and fair as you would want others to be when saying things about you that, though true, are not complimentary. Then he spoke about uh, uh, perfect examples of moral difficulties that ensue when individual good clashes with societal good. In this specific case, the rabbi suggests that the larger good of society constitutes a higher value than the possible benefit to one individual. And I think I liken this to uh, uh, anti-vaxxers today that don't realize that uh, the protocol uh, when dealing with a biological hazard is just containment first. And so all the the, the, the practices around the vaccines and uh, uh, masks and not uh, letting people into restaurants and things like that is about containment. Never lose sight that it's uh, for the greater good of society, containing the virus for the greater good of society. Um, how can we reconcile our and society's need to have outlets for unacceptable feelings with the need to protect the objects of those feelings? Difficult to balance, but there's certain practices that, uh, um, we see the Hebrew people do not stand by while your neighbor's blood is shed, Leviticus 19.16, which Jewish law understands as mandating that one not withhold help or information that can be of life and death significance to another person. Okay, in short, negative information that is related to the person's job performance should be made known. Negative information that is unrelated to job performance should not. This is about when it was okay to talk about. If somebody's uh, applying for a trusted position and they're known to be untrustworthy, say financial matters, you wouldn't want them to be the head of a, an investment firm. And this was a, a very, very wise concept that, uh, had me think in short, public figures should not be exempt from the right to privacy that we all enjoy. And, um, I think when we read this, the logic came out that people don't realize. I think they're getting pub, public eye that uh, they're usually under more scrutiny um, as if the, when the public tre- teaches public figures, when, the, when, yeah, when society treats public figures as not having the right to privacy and don't ever wonder why uh, privacy rights are eroded because things flow from the top down. And if you think that your politicians don't have the right to privacy and you can slander and ruin them on, on, on a whim with a statement, uh, the reality is they're going to vote inevitably for uh, people to live in the same environment that they have to. And uh, it's just not healthy in that regard. 
Okay. If a husband or wife or two siblings or friends do not restrain their words when they are angry, love is unlikely to survive no matter how deeply the two people once cared for each other. The ability to control what we say when we're angry is a prerequisite for lasting relationship. Whoa, prerequisite. That is such a key. <clears throat> that you feel rage does not entitle anyone to inflict emotional pain on others any more than feelings of sexual attraction entitle you to rape the source of your attraction. So it's just the way rage disconnects the mind and, you know, it just comes out. It's sad. Some might argue that unlike rape, rage is justifiable. Then again, what angry person doesn't feel that his or her rage is justified? They always do. One of anger's insidious qualities is that one can find a thousand excuses for it, and while rage sometimes is justified, that what other emotion sh should one feel towards an Adolf Eichmann Eich or Charles Manson? Well, you know, righteous indignation is not rooted in rage. It is indignant because it knows... Um, the benefits of positive uh, living. Even when anger is justified, all that it justifies is expressing anger proportionate to the provo provocation. And sadly, those that are enraged always overdo it, overkill. The Torah's point is profound. When angry, you should attempt to speak, not hit or burst out in rage. If you start to scream and shout like a fool and you feel like a fool and you earn the disrespect of everyone, uh, anyway, if anybody's got questions about this book, please type them away. People who have less control must recognize the moral obligation to curb their harsh words. If they find themselves incapable of doing so on their own, they are morally obligated to seek the sort of professional help that will enable them to exert greater self-control. This was a, a, a neat four-stage uh, uh, point. St Dr. Stephen Marmer, a psychiatrist, recommends that in dealing with anger, we should think in terms of layers or cascades of control. Control our initial uh, reaction, control our initial response, Control our initial reaction to others' responses. Control our succeeding reactions. When Mammonides uh, uh, wrote on the need to control one's temper, he also warned that a person should not become so indifferent to what others do that he becomes like a corpse, totally incapable of feeling. And, uh, yeah, Mamanese explanation on indolence, um, and it's in its, uh, extreme shortfall, um, you become like a corpse and you just can't feel any anymore. And, um, uh, it's a very, 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 uh, detrimental state of, of being. Yeah, I didn't realize I was so close to the end, uh, folks, or I would have finished it Thursday, you know, an extra five or ten minutes then just to, to, to finish it. But um, if anybody's got suggestions for a new book, please uh, drop me a line. Um, if not, I may take some time off. There's no sense if uh, I'm not getting any feedback. Um, never use damaging personal information to invalidate your adversary's contentions. An inability to follow this simple rule is what transforms so many relatively moder moderate arguments into angry quarrels. It, it escalates the affair. It's like throwing gasoline on a, on a fire. So what caused an escalation? The, the very intimacy of a relationship provided the adversaries with destructive information that they could use against each other and also ensured that their harsh words would have an impact. I don't know. Hatred makes a straight line crooked. An ancient Hebrew proverb teaches when people become angry, their reason becomes bent. 
Yeah. Anyways, uh, when it comes to criticism, you got to keep this phrase in mind. A person is willing to pay a doctor for trying to heal him. Should he be any less grateful to one who helps him correct his spiritual failings? So um, don't ever be reactionary to uh, spiritual criticism, uh, especially if it's coming from a rabbi or somebody you you value or appreciate. Um, Nobody ever wants to think of themselves as less, but but to jump on somebody who's honestly trying to do good work in your life, um, you know, think of it like a doctor, a person, you, you know, is willing to pay a doctor, uh, all the more one should be willing to uh, at least accept the advice of a, a grateful friend, um, one who's corrective only because they care, but know the difference. There's a difference between somebody, I think he explained, when somebody is sharing criticism, uh, corrective criticism, uh, because they honestly care, it's so much different than, uh, than just exploitive. Since then, I've learned more from life than from books. The notion that in a moment of self-satisfaction, a man of great stature could say something vicious no longer shocks me. Yeah. This one I found very, very, very profound when dealing with younger children, especially, you know, teenagers, it is not reasonable to judge them by adult behavioral standards. It's just not reasonable. And, uh, you know, yes, there's always room to grow, but it's not reasonable to hold them to such standards. Wow. One's disposition should always be pleasant with people. And it's something I've always got room to work on for sure myself. I spent a lot of years working around people, working with people, but it's different when you're serving them uh, with a, as a means to an end than in, than in honestly uh, connecting with them. Such an I don't care what the cost is fidelity to truth creates a very inhospitable dynamic. And, um, yeah, I found this to be quite a profound. Uh, truthfulness in statements is the formal duty of an individual to everyone. However great may be the disadvantage occurring to himself or herself, but don't have such a, I don't care what the cost is fidelity to truth because it creates an, an inhospitable dynamic. And I've seen this so often. Um, and I think this lesson, uh, apparently God wishes to teach Samuel that one does not owe the truth to would be murderers. Zakia has a question. For example, what should I do if in a group of female friends and all of a sudden one of them start to tell gossip or telling a life other, should I move off them or should I talk the, them that is no not right? Um, you know what, Zakia, you know, be tactful, be um respectful or they're going to look at it as uh, uh an incitement so um if there's a a, a a clear opportunity for you to step back um they will see the morality in your decision if there's a clear opportunity that doesn't isolate if if you're if you're doing it and stepping back as punitive if it comes across as punitive to them like let's say one lady in that group is more prone to speak about others nonstop. If 
you're stepping out while they start talking. They, they, they're going to try and distort it against you and uh, accuse you of being punitive. And then they could blame it on you being uh, B'nai Noach and blame it on the, the Jewish people. I see people do this all the time uh, incorrectly. Um, so, so be courteous. Um, but overall, it's probably best to not, not hang out with people that speak such. If you know that they're prone to it, might be best to just, you know, back off, remove yourself uh, slowly from the group uh, so that you don't uh, hang out with them as often. Um, I'm confident you can find more positive people or positive situations uh, to use your time. Yeah, I found some real wonderful uh, comments in here about uh, uh, about the question of being the sh truthful uh, contemporary implications that we too should not accustom a child to lie on our behalf. Uh, a child raised by his parents to lie and cheat for their convenience will quickly learn to lie and cheat for his own convenience. Um, yeah, of course... Uh, Yeah, and the child may at first be bitterly disappointed, but eventually will conclude cynically that this is how the real world works. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this the last week since we read that. Aaron was uh, an example of kindness. He would always do what he could, uh, uh, Moses' brother. Later, when the two met, they would embrace and kiss each other. The rabbis endorse Aaron's behavior not because Jewish law approves of lying per se. It does not, but because it recognizes that in cases where peace and truth conflict, peace should sometimes take precedence. And 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 uh, that's what you need to keep in mind, uh, Zakia. is there are uh, uh, moments where uh, peace... Uh, you know what, for you, I'm going to back this up a little. According to rabbinic teachings, Aaron, Moses' older brother and high priest, valued making peace between feuding parties so highly that he flat out lied to achieve this end. In a well-known midrash, a rabbinical commentary on biblical text, the rabbis relate, when two men had quarreled, Aaron would go and sit with one of them and say, my son, see what your friend is doing. He beats his breast and he tears his clothes and he moans. Woe is me. How can I lift my eyes and look my companion in the in his face? This is talking about somebody who, who knows they have offended somebody. Uh, I am ashamed before them uh, since it is I who treated him foully. Aaron would sit with him until he had removed all anger, literally jealousy from his heart. Um, then Aaron would go and sit with the other person and likewise do the same thing. Uh, until he had removed all his anger from his heart. Later, when the two met, they would embrace and kiss each other. So the rabbis endorsed Aaron's behavior, not because Jewish law approves of lying per se. It does not, but because it recognizes that in cases where peace and truth conflict, peace should sometimes take precedence. So if if ladies are inviting you uh, uh, to come sit and you know that they're just a gossip uh, uh, chain, um, you know, let peace take precedence in the matter and, you know, do without the, the invite. Uh, but don't be provoking in the sense of saying, I can't hang out with you bunch of gossip girls. Uh, they might take offense at that. So, you know, pursue the peace in the situation and think about it thoroughly and its effects of what you say and do. Um, if they see it properly, that you're trying to stand upright on a moral point, they may inquire, and that might open opportunity for you to share some great uh, Torah material. But incorrectly, their rage will just keep running. And so, um, yeah. yeah. Truth is a very important value, but not an absolute one. To swear to something untrue in the name of God is never allowed, though. So when... 
while most lying is reprehensible, people who pride themselves on always being truthful sometimes use this as an excuse to become verbal sadists. In his autobiographical, autobiographical a writer's notebook, Somerset uh, uh, conveys how cruel truth told solely to benefit the speaker wrought an unbearable consequence. So, yeah. It's kind of an untruth when it's solely to benefit the speaker. I'm sure you, you wouldn't, Zakia. yeah. Yeah, so people can be malevolent truth tellers. Telling the truth at the time she chose to do so was an even was an even more evil act than her original act of adultery. Verbal sadism is commonly common and particularly harmful within marriages. So yeah, I understand when somebody's being verbally sadistic. In human relations, kindness and lies are worth a thousand gratuitously painful truths. But then they talk about macro lies. Never, you know, macro lies are an absolute no. This was another point where they talked about how in World War I, uh, the stories about um, there was anti-German propaganda after World War I that actually caused many people in the West to um, not respond appropriately when the Holocaust started. Uh, nobody wanted to be duped by lies. So with this, when people are overstretching the truth, embellishing, um, I find they always cause this in people. They cause it, it's that cry wolf uh, mentality um, that uh, will cause people to shut off when they need to respond uh, at a later time because they've heard somebody cry wolf far too often. And, um, yeah. Can I go back to perspective and truth? Mm. Perspective and truth. Okay. I would designate such a person as a malevolent truth teller. She didn't inform her husband of her adultery at the time it occurred, perhaps because she wanted to retain the advantages of living with him. As he was a wealthy man, instead she waited decades until her husband had forged a very close bond with the boy he assumed was his. Now that she was suffering from uh, mental instability and perhaps was incapable of enjoying her life, she wished to see her husband suffer as well. Uh, this was about a lady who had uh, uh, an extramarital affair and got pregnant and uh, let her husband raise the child as his own without telling. That was a macro lie. Uh, if you want me to go back more. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to back this up for you, Sheila. There are a few specific instances in Jewish tradition actively encourages lying. Okay. From Judaism's perspective, life is almost always a higher value than truth, okay? So that you certainly do not owe the facts, just the facts, to a criminal who will use them to murder someone. You're also entitled to lie to a thief. Go one more page back, you think? Okay. Yeah, we were talking about Aaron's behavior. As a general principle, lying can be considered moral when the truth can do no good, but only cause pain. Ashley G is quoting a, uh, uh, she a quote she loves by Robin Williams. Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. So be kind always. Very good, yeah. As a general principle, lying can be considered moral when... The truth can do no good, but only cause pain. 
And um, this is a very, very key point. If, if you think telling the truth is, if it can do no good but only cause pain, there's no reason to share it. It becomes immoral to share it. Thus, if a person uh, about to go to a party puts on a dress or a suit that is unattractive and asks how she or he looks, and you should respond truthfully. By doing so, you'll perhaps save the person from embarrassment. But if you meet someone at a party in those same garments and the person asks the same question, it would be pointless and gratuitously cruel to answer, you look terrible, even if you think, even if it's what you think. And I've known people that are sadists that way that uh, they're, they're, see, you can be brutally honest, but it's still brutal. It doesn't make it uh, have has has nothing to do with 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 holiness. Uh, brutal honesty is is brutality still. There are a few specific, specific instances in Jewish tradition actively encourages lying. From Judaism's perspective, life is almost always a higher value than truth, so that you certainly do not owe just the facts to a criminal who will use them to murder someone. You're also entitled to lie to a thief concerning the whereabouts of an object he wishes to steal. In certain instances, particularly where you are dealing with an unscrupulous person, preserving property is also a higher value than truth. As we discussed in chapter 2, if an individual asks you what someone has said about you, her, you're permitted, indeed obligated, to leave out the negative comments, except in certain rare cases. If the person continues to press you for information, I've seen people that, you know, they know somebody's talked bad about them and they want to hear you say it, and then they'll hold it against you. What else did he say? You're permitted to lie if necessary and answer nothing else. He said nothing negative. Jewish, some people won't accept that answer and that's their issue and they need to own it's their issue jewish law places one restriction on this rare rare permission to lie taking an oath to a false statement i swear in hashem's name that uh he only said wonderful things about you to swear to some something untrue in the name of hashem is never allowed thus from judaism's perspective Truth is a very important value, but it is not an absolute one. I found this uh, a profound concept. Um, I've seen so many people that get tunnel vision. It's not the truth. And they want to freak out. And um, they don't realize where they're, they want, bru- they want honesty, but, but they're being brutally honest and um, they're still being brutal. So. You know, it's always uh, best to avoid that, uh, enabling that brutality, especially when it's told solely for the benefit of the speaker. What's this? All right, so let's see. Yeah, that was about the... uh, Moral errors. Yeah. Then this story about uh, the the number of women that had died from uh, anorexia uh, and how it was used by uh, women's lib organizations to incite um, hate against men, uh, saying it was their ideals uh, wanting skinny women. So. Uh, it left this false impression. And one thing you I'll find often is is blame is a very, 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 very dangerous thing. If people talk to you and they're blaming, that's usually a sign to back the heck off, right? Okay. Blame is is a juvenile behavior. Um yeah. It should never uh don't let blame come out of your mouth. Uh, and this, I love the way the rabbis honestly talk always about how Hashem rules everything and, um, blame always tries to take away from Hashem and point the finger somewhere, uh, um, wickedness at somebody and tries to stick a tag on them. 
And so, uh, yeah, be on guard against Blaine. Yeah. Pride issue, uh, blame, obligation, uh, and jealousy. These are things that really, really are negative traits. You can flush pride, get rid of it. Issue. If you see people, oh, I got an issue. I got an issue. I got an issue. Some people are just drama seekers. That's all they do is raise issue. And if they're going to bring up issues about other people, odds are they'll bring up issues about yourself to others as well. So you can avoid people that have issue after issue after issue. They, they seek issue. They think that that's living. And in reality, it's dying. You're always going downward. Um, pride issue, blame, obligation, and jealousy. And obligation, you must understand that as human beings, that a human obligation should only be before Hashem. And, um, you know, the Torah is clear that even the, the Jewish people of all the commandments, they can breach a commandment if it's uh, contrary to uh, one of the big three, if it's going to cause uh, death. They, they just, you know, they, the preservation of life takes precedence. And um, um, you'll find that uh, uh, the sense of obligation in some people's life, I had to, um is incorrect. You know, duty comes with, uh, it's des it's role. Um, you know, like, uh, in military, uh, there's a duty that goes out. Same with doctors. Doctors have that, uh, they take that, uh, Hippocratic oath uh, to do no harm. And, um, you know, there's a sense of duty to do no harm. Um, but sometimes it's not a, a obligatory and we need to understand and put obligation into its proper perspective as parents. Um, so often uh, wicked parents have uh, felt an obligation to, you know, uh, crack the whip in their home or, or put the hammer down and, and it can cause uh, many other issues. Um, you know, uh, you can't go wrong with uh, gentleness and kindness I think that's what he's really bringing out here in the beauty of words that um, heal um, do uh, tend to that gentler tone um, and uh, always uh, strive for kindness. And, 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 and uh, I've always had difficult as a big fellow, I've always had difficult with being flowery. Um, nobody ever wants to, as a man, you don't want to ever want to sound effeminate. And, uh, yet, uh, uh, you've got to learn to be kind and straightforward, but respect comes when, when people are able to be, uh, people of integrity and put the words in play that are genuine and heartfelt and connect, um, with the people you're trying to, uh, engage with. Uh, but this will actually make the world a better place uh, when you're out there sharing or being involved. But understanding the ethics behind uh, the whole principles behind what he's taught in this wonderful book, um, the principles, uh, uh, you know, show how um, these words that you choose, they shape your destiny. You end up going downward when you live with that uh, sense of pride and, and uh, um yeah, you don't want to be uh, uh, imposing on others and uh, blaming and, and, and running around with a sense of obligation and jealousy uh, because um, yeah, it just doesn't work. But uh, speaking words that heal, uh, you know, honesty isn't always the best policy. You can be uh, brutally honest and you're still being brutal. Keep that in mind. Um, but, but be clear, don't become a liar, uh, either. Don't think it's always, uh, okay. It's unfortunate that healing words often don't work their magic with the same speed as hurtful ones. Keep this in mind as well, that when you make, uh, hurtful words, they're, you know, like, uh, like a dart, they literally, uh, pierce like a knife where, um, uh, Healing words take a lot more time. You got to think of them like salve. Uh, it goes on and it 
it's like medicine. It takes time to start to do the work. Uh, but people will recognize when they see adjustment in your tone, adjustment in your demeanor, adjustment in, in, in your, your soul, uh, shining forward. Um, one of life's unfair aspects is that hurtful words are usually far more potent than healing ones. And, um, uh, you know, I think, uh, Tanox is a, a good word in due season, how sweet it is. And, um, you know, it actually allows Hashem's light to shine into circumstances and situations. Got to see it that way. And so uh, choose your words wisely. Um, understand your periphery in situations out there, circumstances, so that your your eyes are open uh, to the the impacts of what's going on in every scenario so that you... Um, you choose your words wisely and caring and kind and uh, um, your soul actually shines. And uh, this is what I see with uh, true, honest uh, rabbis there. They're trying to let the Torah that's in, in, involved in there, they've, they've ingested into their lives, get out there into the world, real world. Yeah. And he talked about emotional constipation, the inability to express love or gratitude and caring. Even when these emotions are felt, some people become sponges. They just, yeah, uh, they'll soak it up, but they will never give it out. Uh, and they're, they're emotionally constipated. They just can't. And uh, there are cures um, for that, but um they need to uh, feel the love and the gratitude, but don't let them be emotional sponges where they're just going to drain every ounce of your time. The kinder you are, the more genuine you are. And uh, what you'll find if you make conscious steps to, to function this way, Hashem will start to correct your life uh, personally in a brighter and, and, and more interconnected walk. Um, because he sees the intent of your, your motive and your heart and, uh, um, uh, he'll try to adjust it to make it, uh, uh, effective when he sees that you're actually not only trying to walk with him, but work with, with him in making it function out there. Um, but there are people out there that are emotionally constipated. They don't have the ability to express proper love and gratitude. And even caring. I mean, some people are so uh, mired or dirty with the uh, uh, wicked behavior that, um, you know, you can't, it's just like a dirty, dirty, dirty vehicle. You can't just throw a, a bucket of water on it and call it clean. It needs a deep polishing or, or scrubbing. Uh, same with certain things. You, you wouldn't eat off of a a somewhat dirty dish or a dish that was soaked in dirty water, you'd, you'd want to get soap on there and clean it off before you used it just so you didn't pick up any, um, anything, uh, bacteria or, or disgusting. Um, but lives get like that as well. Um, the people who suffer from this malady are not necessarily incapable of expressing all emotions. Many are quite, Adept at sharing anger and annoyance. Only when gentler emotions are called for do they become strangely, strangely uh, reticent or inability. Why? For some, the reason why is often unresolved anger or paralysis in the face of other people's needs. I've seen people like this and they have paralysis in the face of other people's needs. They just got to change the conversation back to them. It's all about them. Everything they do is all about them. Shalom, Vigno. Um, but this has been a wonderful book. What others need from us on an ongoing basis is to know that they are cared for, that their good deeds inspire gratitude, and that others love them. It's that simple. Wow. Uh, he urged the synagogue's overflow crowd to resolve that in the coming year. And he learned this is what one rabbi had his 
his synagogue start to say four phrases more often in the future than in the past. Learn to say these four. Thank you. I love you. How are you? What do you need? Just getting these out will help the type of interconnectivity you have with others. And um, then he started to go into some uh, great things about gratitude. In short, the people nearest to us should not be taken for granted or made to wait for special occasions to hear our gratitude. Conveying appreciation is something we must do repeatedly. If we don't, we are quite simply ingrates. Whoa. And Hashem sees how we function. We got to think that to ourselves, you know. Uh, What are the ramifications if I do say this or if I don't say that? and know when to get the good word out there in due season. Ascertaining what someone needs allows us to give him or her what is most meaningful and is thus perhaps the highest expression of love. According to the Talmud, one of the first questions the heavenly court addresses to those who have died is, did you hope for the world's redemption? And, you know, what did you, what did you do to participate in that? These are the kind of questions that are going to come after, uh, when we stand before Hashem, did you study my Torah? And, uh, you know, did you hope for the world's redemption? This is what we, we try with the, with the Noahide World Center, make the world a better place. In other words, did you work toward leaving the world a better place than you found it? If you become the sort of person who learns to avoid speaking hurtful things about and to others and accustom yourself to saying the words that boy, that lift the spirits of those around you, you will have gone a long way toward fulfilling the age old mission Hashem addressed to humankind to perfect the world under the rule of Hashem. And this is just such a, a, hopefully you guys can take that home from this book. Um, I'm glad, uh, you know, we've been able to get through it. Um, you know what? I know it's, uh, uh, been a short session today, but I think we'll call it, uh, we'll call it a day. And, um, I want to thank you guys for hanging, uh, in with me. And even those of you that have, uh, uh, given support, it, uh, it's inspirational. Uh, I'm really on the bubble, you know, do I, I want to keep going, but, um, you know, uh, like anybody else, I have basic needs. And so I may uh, even consider looking for uh, a job out there, which may take me away from doing these. And I do appreciate uh, every one of you that have been coming regularly. Zakia, Ashley G, and many, many others. Sheila, I appreciate you guys, you know, because it uh, it inspires me to spend time personal study and doing it together we're, 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 we're learning things that I think are useful and um, things we can integrate in the here and now. And um, it's just a joy to be a part of uh, 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 connection with uh, people all around the planet. Um, Rabbi Goldberg gave a very good lesson yesterday during uh, uh, our Genesis class. I, can, I recommend everybody check that out on uh, the No Hide World Center YouTube. Um, but I may end up, uh, taking some time off of these Rocky mountain readings. We've been going at it very steady now for, uh, five full months nonstop. So four days a week, five months. Um, the point was to just try to get me over the 600, uh, uh, broadcast mark. And I know we're getting closer to 700. So, um, uh, yeah, it's just a joy. I'm really uh, uh, looking to see what Hashem would have me direct or do. Um, thankfully, I got another uh, 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 spiritual leader recommendation letter from uh, the Noahide World Center signed by Rabbi Shirky and Rabbi Goldberg. It's always inspiring to keep one going, um, but the, you know the needs of this world still are there. And uh, it wouldn't be right of me. My spouse uh, works full time. And I love her dearly, and um, it wouldn't be right of me to just uh, uh, lean on her financially. And, um, you know, I should uh, make sure that I'm doing uh, all I can to uh, be
be supportive uh, to her so she doesn't feel burdened in this world. It's kind of a part of an obligation in the, in the relationship. So um, keep me in your prayers. If anybody's got suggestions or wants to hear a specific book, let me know or a topic, and we I'm sure we can come up with something. Uh, but I'm trying to roll as Hashem permits. And, um, uh, you know, so if I'm off for a few days, don't panic, but stay in touch. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to fight hard to keep the doors open, to keep continue sharing uh, the broadcasts. Um, I may not be on with Rabbi Levin for a while uh, on Thursdays, uh, but I want to keep the door open for uh, the broadcast on Saturday from Israel with uh, Rabbi Kaufman and Rabbi Poston, uh, the 48 Ways to Wisdom. It's just a beautiful, profound class, and it's going to get better and better. Uh, he really spoke this week about sharing the burden in Part 39. Very good lesson and how that uh, you know entails, and, and we can find fulfillment of uh, personal purpose in taking that initiative to share the burden of Torah and uh, Hashem responds accordingly. It's just beautiful, uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. So on that note, this is Dan signing out for Rocky Mountain Readings. Stay in touch. Uh, let me know if you want to hear anything specific. And appreciate all the support.